Okay, uh, welcome everybody to the College of Complexes. My name is Tim and I'll be uh, helping out representing this uh, thing tonight. The format of the college is as follows. One, we'll have a brief announcements period. Two, our uh, speaker will then speak up to about an hour. Then we'll have our question and answer period along with our infamous rebuttal period. I'd like to welcome everybody tonight. My name is Tim and uh, Welcome. And uh, Charlie, if you're ready for the announcements, take it away, but I'll need a second or two to get full screen. So uh, take it away, Charlie, with your announcements. All right. Welcome, everyone, to meeting number 3,760 of the College of Complexes, the playground for people who think. For all of those attending by Zoom, will you please mute your microphone? Put a red X on your microphone. Thank you. So as not to interrupt the speaker. Okay. Uh -oh. the capitalist. I will give an advertisement for our upcoming programs. In April, we will be beginning our special Earth Month series of speakers. On April the 6th, our own Andy Anderson will be giving a list of specific things you and I can do to save the planet and what they are doing in other countries, April the 6th. On April the 13th, we've got a candidate for the Green Party, a young lady representing the Xenials of Illinois, and they want pure water and, and, and food. Uh, clean air and things like that. So you can <sighs> listen to a campaign. On April the 20th, uh, the Illinois Green Party will be visiting the college and telling you most about their current agenda and activities. The state chair will be presenting. There's reason now there's been a change in the schedule. April 27th, is presently open. We are trying to look for an ecological speaker, a green speaker. So watch the announcements or make check the main website. That should be filled sometime in the ensuing week. But April 27th has been changed and will be rescheduled at a later date. Transitioning into May, on May the 4th, we have our special May Day speaker on organized labor. And Joe Kopsik will be talking on why the market isn't free. And he says it's a rigged economy and why we should repeal the Taft-Hartley Act. On May the 11th, Dan D. Knight, author of a book, A Realistic Path of Peace, will be talking about the latest edition, the second edition, updated edition of his book on how to start and what to do in the world. Very, it should be interesting. On May the 18th, uh, we'll be talking about nuclear and nuclear reactors and waste disposal. We've got two organizations booked. Uh, uh, the Beyond Nuclear and the Nuclear Energy Information Service. Two expert speakers uh, and a PowerPoint on We're May the 18th. We're still on uh, June the 1st, uh, we're going to have uh, a young man returning, Tom O'Donnell, and he asked the question of that life is not financially fair, and he wants to know why, though it seems to be able to give him an answer, and perhaps we can. You forgot these four dates open in June. Okay. June 8, 15. Please quiet in the background. June 8, 15, 22, 29th. Thank you very much. If you'd like to speak on any of those dates, please forward a title and a description of the presentation. I need both of those in order to confirm a date. Okay, Tim, take it away. Uh, why, why, what, what happened to uh, your uh, your little bit from uh, 
May, on May 25th. You forgot to announce that one, which was down here. On May 25th, I'll be speaking with Andy Anderson and the, the Northwest Information Service about is America doomed for a new dark age or are we headed for a bright future? It's a comprehensive summary of the Republican criminals who are planning to steal the 2024 election and the legal loopholes in, in our voting laws. I'm hoping to give a little bit more of a positive message by reelecting Joe Biden. All right, that's about it. We're going to go in and uh, we're going to get this show on the road. All right. All right, uh, to everybody here at the college, I'd like to uh, call up to our uh, to our thing, Fran Tobin of the, uh, what are we going to Okay, uh, Fran Tobin, come on up and you're ready to go. Just introduce yourself right now. Say your organization and we'll be all set. You'll have the uh, floor and go right ahead. All right, all right. Well, thanks everybody for being here and being people that actually pay attention to public policy and to our world and the ways that we live in it and perhaps can even change it for the better. And shockingly, sometimes people disagree about what better means. And many of us here in this room, and I'm sure those on, out on Zoom land, uh, have some different views on what counts as better and how we can get there. So I'm Fran Tobin, and I'm here on behalf of representing a diverse coalition called the Humanized Long-Term Care Campaign. So I work for a labor community coalition called the Alliance for Community Services which has multiple campaigns around improving, extending, and protecting public services that meet human needs, from public health care programs like Medicaid and Medicare, to worker rights so that workers in these services, whether they're caregivers or adult education teachers, and city colleges, or caseworkers in the Department of Human Services, have the resources and support and dignity that they deserve as workers, and broadly, to uh, advance a society where we actually care about each other, put it simply, and frankly, perhaps most radically. So I first want to say that I'm speaking on behalf of this campaign. Um, my expertise is mostly taking experiences and learnings that I've gotten from others and helping to communicate those and helping to get folks organized and coordinated in a way that their experience and their values can move forward. That's part of my role as an organizer. And especially on this long-term care issue, I want to acknowledge that some of my teachers are here in this room. Mike Rice and Shelly Berry and Dr. Edwards and Clark Craig and others. These are the folks that I'm learning from. And so I hope that I'm properly and effectively representing the experience and vision that, that folks in the disability justice community have. So I'm gonna, in terms of the topic around how do we humanize long-term care, before we get to that specific thing, I wanna go back a ways, hope not to be too boring about this. It'll be a, a very fast hundred year uh, the world, or at least the part of the world in this United States of America. So on the one hand, this campaign, the Humanized Long-Term Care Campaign, was conceived and led by people with disabilities. So at its heart, it's a disability justice campaign. And folks with disabilities are the people that have defined what the goals and values are. On that score, I think it's important for us to put in a little bit of context that when you think about disability justice, and that extends to elders, um, but primarily in disability justice, we have to understand that the very concept of inclusion and accessibility have always been central to any kind of advance for disability justice. Back 100 years ago, people with disabilities were on the streets protesting. What were they pro? Well, a lot of things, but one of the things that they were protesting at the time was the New Deal. Not that there was a New Deal, but that many, in fact, in fact, most of the programs 
conceived of that were important, that were valuable, that helped a lot of people, excluded people with disabilities. People with disabilities were protesting because they were excluded from the Works Progress Administration. They were excluded from the Civilian Conservation Corps. They were exclu excluded from all of those things that were rightly conceived of to change society, to look at public goods that were needed and putting people to work, providing some of those public goods. And yet a significant part of our population, our friends and neighbors and family were excluded. There was a little bit of progress at that time, back in the 1930s. But my point is that even a lot of well-meaning programs, not just well-meaning, but good programs have had exclusionary vision and ableist understanding of what it means to make the public good real. And that has continued throughout this time. So on the one hand, we have this idea that within the disability justice community, not being segregated, not being excluded, being included is a core part of humanity. It's a part of recognizing the dignity and humanity of that person. And as a society, we've made some progress, largely because of the work and organizing that people with disabilities have done, uh, but we've got a long way to go. So on a different track, we've got two things converging here. On a different track, we're gonna talk about public spending for human goods and human needs. In particular, healthcare, it's a long-standing pattern that people like us recognize that there is a need, a human need, whether it's the healthcare or housing or transportation or whatever the thing is. There are these things that as we think about what is a good society, perhaps even a great society for those who are old enough to think about that kind of stuff, um, that you know, how do we get closer to that? And so there's always some kind of program. And, and by program, I just mean a mechanism for advancing that particular goal. In order to have access to healthcare, there needs to be some kind of mechanism, some kind of program that will make sure that people get it. So that is both a way to pay for it and people who are the actual caregivers, the actual providers that are the ones that deliver health care to people. So those are the folks, the nurses, the doctors, the CNAs, those are the folks, the, the PAs who are actually delivering health care. They're, they're the providers. Humana is not a provider. They're a mechanism for managing money in a way that eventually pays somebody who is a provider, but they skim off the top. That's part of their business model. And that goes for these others. So the long-standing pattern, whether it's trying to reduce child labor, whether it's trying to get health care for more people, whether it's public education so that we can have an educated society, whether it is people are organizing, people are mobilizing, people are doing the work so that public resources are delivered toward that end. And by accomplishing that, we start getting those kinds of services built into an expectation of what a good society is. And it starts getting people to get those things, those human goods, those public goods, whether it's healthcare or a home services program, or being able to get a wheelchair that actually fucking works. I mean, all of those things, this is all part of the process of delivering public goods to human beings. However, <clears throat> That all is driven by people that are trying to meet human needs. So we do the work, we do the organizing. We and probably I don't deserve to be called part of that we because it started long before me and play a little teeny role in all of this. So people organize, people fight for having these kinds of programs exist. And then money starts. Now here's where things get messy. Okay, they've been messy, but here's where they start to get messier, which is once there's money flow, once people like Shelly and Takra and Clark have done the organizing, and Larry Biondi, who isn't with us today, who've done the organizing so that these kinds of programs can be funded and therefore deliverable to human beings, there's money flowing, and there are people that are in it for the money that say, how do we get some? Now, they can't just say, 
give us $100 million because we've got political clout. So what they have to do is they have to say, well, tell you what, we'll set up one of, our, one of these programs. We will do this, quote unquote, health care service. So in order to get the money, <clears throat> they create a mechanism to deliver just enough of the, of the good that they can collect the money. So they're not in it for the good. They're in it for the money. And this is a long-standing difficulty, a challenge for those of us promoting public services that meet human needs is to keep the focus on the human needs and not about the cash flow. There are, there's a difference qualitatively <clears throat> between an entity that is a charitably focused entity that is trying to provide food or housing or shelter or healthcare. And in order to do that, they have to find ways, the bake sales, the contracts, the, the private grants, all that stuff. They have to find the ways to have enough money so that they can manage the program. They need the money and they need the program, but then there's a different category, which is people that are doing just enough of the program in order to keep the money flowing. And what we see in long-term care is that increasingly, the people, the players who are coming at this from a charitable, from a human, from a, we care. We care about people with disabilities. We care about old people. We want people to actually be taken care of. There are still some of those folks in the system, no doubt. And the vast majority of direct workers are trying to do their best caring for people, but they work in a system. They work in a building. They work under rules controlled by the owners of these facilities. And the owners, by and large, are in it for the money. It doesn't mean people don't get any care in their facilities. It means that which is the priority? We have a long history and data shows across the board repeatedly, not just now post pandemic, which is not really post, not through then, that for-profit facilities are far more likely to be understaffed, to have more violations, to have bad infection control, all of the things and lower ratings. And most of these ratings are self-reported. So um, they're not even that reliable in the first place. There's a fundamental tension between profit and care. You know, it's an obvious thing. And it's something that in any kind of system where both of those things are linked, we have to deal with. So what's, what's my point? When we look at the long-term care system, it's broader than just nursing facilities and those kinds of institutions. But when people think about it, that's the main thing people are thinking about. And increasingly, that part of the long-term care system is dominated by people who are owners, who are in it for the money. Right now, the report just came out that indicated that 72% of all the long-term care facilities, I don't mean all the programs, but the institutions, the nursing homes and the institutional settings, 72% are private equity owned now. Private equity, we all know what that means, right? It's basically Wall Street, investors, people that are money movers. They are not in any way providers of care. They are investors in an industry that is highly profitable. They work through multiple systems to hide their profits, just as charter school operators have, some of them, not all certainly, just as other kinds of operators, just as low-income housing developers have found ways to scam the system and create shells and hide their cash flow and make it look like, oh yeah, we're really broke. So it's very common in the nursing home world, and I'm using nursing home broadly, not just in what technically in the state law counts as a nursing home. Um, it is very common for what they call related entities to all be part of a system for concentrating profits in a handful of owners. And that's why Wall Street wants to invest. That's why they're sucking up nursing homes and hospitals and other kinds of facilities, because they think they can squeeze the care to maximize their profits. And they're doing it. So one of the many examples is that a facility, you can have a corporation or an LLC, or it's legally structured, 
So this is the, you know, it's the uh, you know, Manor Shores, I'm making that name up. So there probably is a place called that, but I'm not talking about that place. Uh, the theoretical Manor, Manor Shores uh, nursing home. So that place, it's private, it's for profit. It's, it's operated for profit. It has an owner or a set of owners. But Manor Shores is delivering profits to their owners. They're hiring their CNAs and the other people who work inside the facility, even some social workers who, for the most part, aren't actually social workers, just to be clear. And, and often, if they try to do actual social work, they get fired, but we'll put that aside for now. Um, so, Manor Shores doesn't own the building. Manor Shores, Manor Shores my completely theoretical uh, nursing home, pays rent to somebody who owns the building. Just so happens that the lead partner who owns Manor Shores is also a partner of the building owner, which is Shore Manor LLC. Totally different facility, totally different operation. They're just a real estate investment trust or a, you know, whatever thing. They're the landlords. So contract goes into Manor Shores. Manor Shores pays people, including Shore Manor which owns the building for the rent. So look, look at all that money they're paying for rent. Oh yeah, and they have a management company too, which is Manor of Shore Speaking, LLC, with some of the same owners, but they're managing the property and doing some kind of administrative consulting for the nursing home. So when you look at just the quote unquote nursing home, it looks like they're barely breaking even. And if you look at that cash flow, yep, you know, and they'll say that they, their big national lobby group, which somehow manages to get tens of millions of dollars in uh, dues from these completely broke nursing homes to do their lobbying. Um, you know, they'll say that the profit margin is, is sometimes less than a couple of percent. And in some, they recently did a report that indicated it was even less than that. So they're making this argument, A, we are totally broke. We have no money, which is A, an excuse to not give care. It's like, what are you supposed to do? How are we supposed to pay people a different wage, a decent wage, I mean? How are we supposed to hire enough staff to actually give people the care? We have no money. Unless you give us tons more money, you know, grandma's going to get it. But what they're not pointing out is that the same owners who are running that facility are also cashing in on the real estate and on the management. And in some cases, they have their own pharmacies and, and all these other different related companies. So there are all these different ways where, according to the Long-Term Care Community Coalition, some research come out there, you know, it's easily over 9% profit, uh, which is higher than a typical industry would be. So the point here is that we have these two converging things. One is, again, big picture. We have people fighting rightly for inclusion, for accessibility, for humanity, to be treated as fully human human beings. On the other hand, we have that fight contributing to creating a cash flow in various entities whose job, whose interest is the cash flow and not the care, stepping in and taking up more and more and more of that industry. So we have this situation where this is the conflict. And as the investor-based players take up more and more of the industry, it squeezes out the players that are more charity focused, the ones that actually got into this to try to provide care. And there are still plenty of those. Okay, not plenty. There are still those. So this gets us to the situation we're in right now here in Illinois, where uh, the majority of these institutions that are supposed to be care institutions are for-profit, industry-oriented, profit-oriented operations that are focused on profit and not people. As part of that, people with disabilities and the disability justice community has been arguing for many years 
that even without some of the more egregious examples that we hear about, that being confined in an institution when long-term care could be provided in a home or a community-based setting, independent living, some kind of community group home that's the right size that people actually want to be in, that is community in, that has community integration at its heart. But a kind of place, a place to have the kind of care where you as the individual, it's person-centered, you as the individual get to have the care that you need, long-term care, but in the least restrictive environment that is appropriate, that is suitable for that person. And as long as so much of our money is being diverted into the industries that are more about the revenue than they are about the people, then we don't have the real alternative. So people don't have choices. We have had many of our own members be in a place where at some point or other in their lives, they had no choice. They didn't have the real option to get the kind of care they needed in the community. Some of us, including some people here, had been in these facilities, had been in these institutions, fought for years to get out. They were told by the industry and by too much of the public system that you can't live by yourself. You can't live independently. Don't you know? Sure, that'd be nice, but da 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 da. Fortunately, we've had enough of us around who have won that fight, who have gotten into the community, are living fuller lives at less public cost, with better care, with caregivers who have better working conditions than they would have had in one of these institutions. That is the future of long term care. That person-centered care that allows people to actually be as fully human in the least restrictive environment. Now, here's the other part of the background that's worth noting that almost nobody knows about except you experts that I can see. But so all these years of people organizing for independent living and for not being segregated in oppressive institutions took years and years and years. And that, among other things, led to the 1990 Americans with Disabilities Act. People with disabilities occupied the Capitol Rotunda for how many days? I forget. I wasn't there. I claim no credit. I did a little help on lobbying this, but uh, the people that drove that campaign and made it happen and, and were able to win this fought hard for years to be able to get that. One of the provisions of the ADA was that people had the right to live in the least restrictive environment possible for their condition. And shockingly, that was not implemented. But now it was the law of the land. So now at least it was the law. Up until then, it was like, yeah, you got nothing. However, you now have a law that says that this should happen. It's not happening. So what happens? Lawsuits, tons of lawsuits, because there are all these different ways where the industry operators are holding on to people, keeping them in restrictive, segregated, usually oppressive systems, instead of being able to be in the least restrictive environment and having community living. And so Mike Rice is back in there reminding us what the big picture is. So lawsuits, well, it, it wasn't contestable, it's not debatable. I mean, it's really obvious what the law was and what was actually happening. And so, you know, lawsuit after lawsuit for those judges that were actually paying attention to what that law said, it's like, yeah, you're in violation. You, you, either the state or the facility, whoever is the funding entity, that's managing these programs, you are discriminating against people with disabilities. You are illegally segregating people and you're keeping them in environments which are less humane and it's just wrong. So, you know, you win a lawsuit and then they just ignore it. Then you win another lawsuit and then there's an appeal and then another appeal, and another appeal. So we bring it forward, all these legal challenges now that this right has been enshrined in law, but not, not acted on, 
it brings us to the US Supreme Court, which then in the Olmstead decision said, yes, the law is the law. Yes, people actually do have a civil right, not just the privilege or the permission that, gee, if there's enough money, you know, maybe you can let a few people out of these institutions and into the community. This is a civil right. And so um, it should be enforced. The US Supreme Court. And you know how when the US Supreme Court says something, everybody automatically follows. Well, uh, sorry, that only applies to the Second Amendment, not the not the other parts of the Constitution. Uh, so yeah, the Supreme Court ordered. It's like there it is. Da -da -da -da. And then what happened? More failure to follow. More illegal against the law, against the Supreme Court, jurisdiction after jurisdiction, not actually implementing the least restrictive environment. Um, so what did that lead to? More lawsuits. So here in Illinois, there were a few lawsuits that eventually brought to against the state of Illinois because the state as the payer and manager of these programs was illegally discriminating against people with disabilities. So those lawsuits led to what are known as consent decrees. So this, the state said, tell you what, we're not gonna actually get people their civil rights, but tell you what we'll do. We'll make a plan so at least a certain number There'll be a number every year of people that we will get out of the institutions into the community. They'll then their civil rights will be honored. Other people will be left behind, most of them. Uh, but you know, we're we're not into the civil rights thing is just too much. So we're gonna just gonna find some people and we'll create some programs and some of those people will get transferred out of the community. Am I am I missing something, Clark? Because one of my mentors, even if he doesn't know it. Um, so the so then there's a consent decree. So they negotiate. All right. So how much? How many people can you really transfer? It's. I mean, there are tens of thousands of people in these institutions here in Illinois that probably, almost definitely, should be in a less restrictive environment. Should be in some kind of home or community-based program, and they should be that according to the law. Should be there according to their and it would be less costly to the state. So who, who could be against that? Oh yeah, there's no one. Um, so then you have these negotiated numbers and the state agrees, well, I'll tell you what, we can't actually provide civil rights to everybody, but we will at least get this number of people out of institutions into the community. Phew, done. They signed a piece of paper and presto, Hundreds, thousands, oh, okay, that didn't actually happen. So they, they set goals that they thought they could actually meet, like practical, because, you know, they're governors. So, you know, maybe 900 promised, and like on paper, hey, 900 people out of, what, 80,000 um, will get out of the institution into the community. But then 127 actually get out. And then they go back to the court and, and say, well, what are you going to do? File another lawsuit? And then we'll have another consent decree that we won't follow? Year after year after year. This is part of the picture. And again, this is my lived experience. This is the lived experience of some of the folks here that I have the privilege to work with. This is, I know this is a pretty long <laughs> background. This is just the background. The point is, within the disability rights community and the disability justice community, that this kind of failure to recognize the core humanity of people with disabilities has been deep. It has been many decades in the making. And when COVID came along and killed thousands of people in these kinds of institutions, in congregated settings, places where they shouldn't have been in the first place, places that people had a civil right to get out of and into the community, it hit home. And it's a new day because people realize that for all of these decades, we've been pushing incrementally, bit by bit by bit, to improve the situation. And here was a crisis. Now, the system didn't create that crisis. It was a virus. What the fuck, you know? But, but 
Who were the people most likely to suffer and die from this particular virus? People in congregate institutions. The very people who had been left behind, who, according to their civil rights, at least in Illinois, at least thousands and almost for sure tens of thousands of those folks shouldn't have been in those institutions. According to the law, according to the court, according to these consent decrees, and yet they were left there to die. And when the disability community formed what's called the Institutional Rescue and Recovery Coalition. Their focus originally was on rescue because people were in danger. Not just any danger, like everyone was in. There are also about 30,000 people in Illinois who do live in the community getting long-term care with home PAs. It's a very important program. Many of us here make use of that, it's an important program, it should be strengthened, it should be improved, it should be expanded, and we are in no way uh, dissing, okay, there are complaints about it, but it could be better, but uh, the point is, it's important, it's valuable, it en enables thousands of people to live fuller lives. It's a model that could be expanded if there was a political commitment. Those people have very similar health indicators in terms of their conditions, in terms of disabilities, in terms of vulnerabilities to um, uh, susceptibility to, to getting and dying of COVID, all of those things, very similar populations. There were nursing homes where 30% of the people in that building died of COVID. In my neighborhood, I live in Rogers Park, in my neighborhood, there are several that almost a third of the people in that building died of COVID. Similar population in a non congregated, more humane, less expensive, better system with better living and better working conditions, that group had a minimal COVID rate. COVID infections and death were tiny for people that were not cooped up in these institutions that shouldn't have been there in the first place. And when the disability justice folks organized and said, look, this is an emergency, yes. People shouldn't be cooped up in petri dishes for COVID. Let's at least reduce the density. This isn't even empty all the facilities. Nobody ever said that. Reduce the density so that people have a better chance of actually surviving and not getting COVID. Because you had people in two person and three person rooms. How are you supposed to have social isolation? You've got people coming in and out, bringing the virus with them. It's a complicated, it's, it's, this wasn't, intentional in the sense that people said, let's build a system that's going to kill a lot of these people. But it's an almost intentional because there were options to not have this system be the what it is, and they chose for political reasons not to do it. And the reaction of the system, even of a lot of liberals who did some other good stuff, was, eh, people are dying, people are in danger, the people who are most likely to die from this disease are in these places, what, what can we do about it? Yeah, it's too bad. One of the allies said to me, mm, old people die all the time. Like, well, I, I, I assume that doesn't actually represent this person's <clears throat> general thinking. But the point was, this is a population that was left in a bad situation that shouldn't have been, that when the shit truly hit the fan, they were just left. Now, we all know that there were and we don't know. Uh, there were, in fact, many other populations that were deconcentrated in order to reduce risk of getting and spreading COVID. There were students that were put up in hotels. There were homeless shelters. And, and the coalition, we said all of these people in all these congregate settings to reduce the risk of getting and dying of COVID should be depopulated, deconcentrated. So we weren't selective to be everybody. So because it was a disability-led coalition, that was the focus, but throughout. So correctly, some of the homeless shelters were empty because otherwise people would have been getting COVID and died. Who did that for people with disabilities and there's no, nobody, nothing, nowhere. The Federal Emergency Management Agency, one of its charges is to get people out of danger in disasters, in declared disasters. FEMA routinely builds housing for people 
when they need to be taken out of danger. That's is one of the things that FEMA does. It's in their toolkit. It's a standard piece. They've even actually built permanent housing sometimes for folks, but usually it's temporary. So we had a situation where people were in danger. People were in the most COVID dangerous place that they could be in the country. And what did FEMA do? Not our problem. It took a year and a half of organizing and badgering to get FEMA to finally agree to reimburse the cost of rescuing people with disabilities from the most dangerous place they could be in and get them into non-congregate housing with the care they need. So they got the care. All of those people transitioned on an emergency basis out of the nursing home, survived COVID. Large numbers of the people left behind didn't. Why did it take a year and a half to get FEMA to do what they do? The deep ableism, the deep acceptance of treating elders and people with disabilities as throwaways, that's combined with the political clout of the industry, leaves us in a place that is just unacceptable, morally unacceptable, ethically unacceptable, and frankly, budgetarily unacceptable. It costs more money to pay for worse care in an oppressive institution than it does give people better care, better working conditions, better lives in the community. So this was a long background around sort of, so now what? My experience in my read of the folks that started this campaign and are coordinating across Illinois and across the country is we're no longer willing to just be thrown away. We are no longer willing to accept, yeah, we'll get a program that'll get a little bit better and a few more people will get their civil rights. This coalition is looking for a real transformation. We are at an inflection point in which the future of long-term care <coughs> is going to be person-centered. Now, it's not gonna be quick, it's not gonna be easy. It's actually relatively simple. This is one of those where people say, oh, it's complicated. It's actually not complicated. What it is is difficult. It's not the same thing. And it's difficult because of ableism, or primarily because of the financial clout and therefore political clout of the industry that, that can't collect the money if they don't have people in the bed. That's the obstacle more than anything else. It's not the only one. Moving tens of thousands of people from one place into another is not a, is by itself not a simple thing. It is simple to say, let's start to plan to do it. Our state has refused so far to even make a plan. Not only they haven't said, not only have they said, we're not gonna make a transition, they have said, we're not even willing to make a plan. So we're at a place, this coalition is at a place where this is a long-term struggle. People are clear that the vision we have is a long-term care system that has multiple aspects, that is at its center, has people and what people need, and not institutions and what institutions want. Two years ago, President Biden, in his State of the Union speech, made some comments that I'm sure he and his advisor, in fact, he talked some of his advisors, so they all thought, yeah, you guys must have loved what he said at the State of the Union address. He's talked about fixing up nursing homes and getting them better and having them less terrible. And <clears throat> many of the people in this network said, what? Did you ask the disability community like what they wanted? Did you ask if they wanted to have nicer, what's the word, Shelly, what, nicer, nicer containment? People want freedom. The right to transition out. It's enshrined in the law, it's enshrined in the Supreme Court, and yet President Biden, said, well, we'll make the places where they're wrongfully held less bad. Now, less bad is better than worse bad, right? So we got to acknowledge that. 
But there wasn't even a word about meeting people's civil rights. There wasn't a word about actually transitioning significant numbers. And by significant numbers, I don't mean one or two percent. We're talking about significant numbers of people transitioned out of these institutions and into the least restrictive environment where they can thrive and they have their full humanity. So our coalition, the Humanized Long-Term Care Campaign, you know, organized a response to President Biden's State of the Union letter. And again, to, to acknowledge, you know, less bad is better than bad or bad, right? So we, we don't want to pretend that otherwise. We live in political reality. But hundreds of organizations around the country signed on to a letter to the president saying, you just missed the point. You're talking about the wrong thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We should have some things where that are, these places don't get away with so many abuses and so many false reportings and so many retaliatory actions against people who speak up for their rights. You're right. All of that should happen. That's all already on the books. It's not legal to do any of those things. It's not legal to lie about how many CNAs you have in your nursing home, but they do it all the time because this ghost staffing is part of how they've had their profits. Just like they do the related parties investment thing where they have cash flow going in from their left pocket to the right pocket and say, gee, my left pocket's empty. I can't possibly hire more people. So hundreds of organizations around the country a Democratic president said, you missed the point. What we need is a different vision. And had you consulted with disability-led organizations, people whose leadership is made up of and led by people with disabilities, you wouldn't have made this mistake. And to his credit, I'm sure Biden personally read that letter. And, and uh, in fact, I think he called me, but I was busy doing something. But um, his people, his top advisors, from the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid got back to us. So to his credit, they at least said, all right, what do we do? Now, it's got a long way to go, but a couple things have happened through this work. A, FEMA actually changed some of its policies officially. We forced them to open a crack to rescue people, things that they actually do all the time for other people, but not for people with disabilities and not for people stuck in institutions that are in danger. But they opened that little crack and then we forced them to implement some of that in policy. Now they've got a long way to go. FEMA is notorious for being difficult to work with. But that happened. And it happened because people that almost nobody has heard of until they show up and occupy your office it can happen not too unusually. Um, uh, you know, speak up and, and take action. The national federal policy has adopted new transparency. It's not nearly good enough, but it's a step, at least in the right direction, of requiring more reporting for who actually benefits. There's a bunch of loopholes, so it's gotta be fixed and gotta be made better. But the whole hiding of profits is still happening. The federal regulations aren't good enough, but they're a step in the right direction because until this happened, you know, there wasn't even an attempt to do that. There was a study that was done that just came out a few weeks back. It indicated looking specifically at <clears throat> Illinois nursing homes. Facilities, because they're mostly publicly funded, privately owned, for profit operated, publicly funded. They get a piece of that revenue stream. They have to report uh, their revenue and have to report a bunch of other financial stuff. According to this study that was done, by some Canadian researchers, actually. 63% of the profits of these institutions, nursing homes in Illinois, were not disclosed to regulators through these various mechanisms that I talked about. So they were hiding 63% of their cash flow while saying, hey, we're broke. We're broke, so we can't hire those CNAs. We're broke, so how can we possibly have a program where you have a social worker who really helps someone get out of my institution where I lose the revenue and they go into the, into the community? We can't possibly uh, you know, meet all of those darn regulations and stuff that we have a contract to follow, but you know, 
How can you expect that because they're so broke? Well, they're hiding 63% of their profits. That's just here in Illinois. That was in 2019. So we have this situation where it's a new direction. It's a new vision about what, it's the same vision people always had, correct that. The new determination to make that vision real. And so what does that look like in a few ways? So very practically speaking, short term, two things that can be done immediately. One, and perhaps most important, as a short term, good God, we have to actually fight for this kind of thing. You know, the you see the person at the protest sign is like, I can't believe I'm still protesting this shit, you know? It's like, yeah, I can't believe like they're actually bringing back child labor. It's like, what the? Just the list goes on. So it's long been illegal, of course, for facilities to retaliate against people that blow the whistle, that speak up about abuse, that uh, report violations. It's also long been happening. Is there a study done last year that indicated that overwhelmingly widespread, despite being illegal, retaliation happens all the time to people who speak up, and that fear of retaliation is keeps people from speaking up about abuse and neglect and misconduct and ghost staffing and all of the other kinds of violations that take place all the time in these facilities. Well, what does fear of speaking up do? It lets it continue, obviously. Why do they need those things to continue? Because that's how they pad their profits. So right now, there is a proposal in the State Senate of Illinois that would strengthen the anti-retaliation provisions by creating a deterrence so that for the first time ever, residents would be able to act on their own behalf to take a legal action against a facility that retaliates against them. That was already illegal, should never have had to do this in the first place. This isn't even all of the other violations. This is just the retaliation, just the point of saying, you know, at a baseline, basic democracy requires free speech. Basic democracy, basic humanity requires the ability to not live in fear day after day after day. Even if you have a complaint that maybe is questionable, you shouldn't be afraid to bring it up. Right, the proper response is, well, let's talk it through. Let's figure out what should be done about this. Instead, not every time, not by every person, but routinely in every facility somewhere in this state today, today, Somebody in this state has had their civil rights quashed by retaliatory action by a nursing home, which sends a message. So one example, uh, one of our members witnessed abuse, actually two of our members witnessed abuse that saw somebody tied up. Um, others have also <laughs> witnessed abuse. And so these folks reported it, they called the ombudsman. The ombudsman called the state regulatory agency, which acts on behalf of residents, but doesn't actually have to listen to residents, that residents have no voice in. Um, but so the Illinois Department of Public Health, IDPH, has their rules that they, their staff have to follow. And like a lot of these other places, you know, most of the staff are trying to do the job, but they're doing the job within a structure that they didn't create. So the IDPH regulators come out the person by then, of course, is not tied up anymore. So the two eyewitnesses that say, yeah, we saw him tied up. Somebody else says, nope. And IDPH says, eh. they call it unsubstantiated. A majority of their claims of complaints that go to IDPH, even complaints filed by professionals, filed by ombuds people, filed by people that are well versed in what the law is. I'm not talking about just some cranky resident that feels like complaining about something, which is how the nursing home owners try to characterize this. That IDPH just blows off most of the complaints. 
And then, most important in this particular case, so the facility got away with it, as they often do. And then they took it out on the people who reported the abuse. So they retaliated against them. They shut down their privileges. They uh, said, you can't see your friend anymore. They would say, you can't go outside to get a smoke break. They would have all these different kinds of, for most of us, something that might seem fairly minor. And this is part of what's difficult, frankly, to get across to legislators. Because of course, first of all, nobody treats them like that. So they don't really know what it would be like. But you now it's like, yeah, you can shrug it off when you have some power, right? But when you're in a, a resident in a facility where they control when you can go outside and when you get your food and whether you get your medicine and all of those kinds of things, it doesn't take much retaliatory action to be a truly oppressive icing, not just chilling effect, but an icing effect in your free speech. And one of those two witnesses, the facility, found a third resident, coerced that person to file a false complaint against one of the witnesses. And then they used a false complaint to put this person out when they had nowhere else to go. Everybody knew this, in front of everybody. What do you think the message is to everybody in that facility? Sit down, shut up. The person who, who filed this false complaint even said, they made me do it. I know it's not true, but they made me. They were going to kick me out if they didn't do this. They said that to the ombudsman, but they were afraid to do more than that because they were afraid. This is the point. This fear is deep. It's deep. It's widespread. So as a core fundamental thing, we are asking folks to support at this bare minimum this, are you kidding? This is something we actually have to fight for? The ability of people to be able to speak up without fear. And I'm going to ask Tim to do a few minutes of testimony from folks who have had some of these experiences. Okay, give me a second to boot up the video and I'll just be a second, okay? Let me boot up the video here. All right. Um, yeah, so, sorry, we've got to share a screen here. Bear with me, please. Come on, come on. Wait a bit. Get a video the people that own the nursing homes doesn't care about it. The, the residents that's there. Um, they, they just worry about money, the money that's coming in, and the money that's going out. A lot of staff get mad when they have a lot of people when they put a lot of people on them and they take it out on most of the uh, residents that are there so yeah I, i've seen a lot of that going on those type of facilities are more like uh, detention centers uh, to keep people off the street basically they're not going to provide the money to provide the resources for those people in those facilities to recover. It's like your cat is there and they will find every excuse in the book why you can't leave there, or why, why you can't do this, why you can't do that. Sometimes people wouldn't receive the medicine that they needed and you actually see them uh, become sick. My sister-in-law was in end-stage multiple sclerosis, and she only had one arm that worked. She hit her call light one Friday afternoon, and that call light was not answered until Sunday morning. The problem came both with my mother and my sister-in-law in trying to get in touch with a doctor or a nurse, either about medications or how to move them, because those people are like ghosts in the wind. The only time the staff would uh, reach out to the patients or myself is when we had the visitors. All of the sudden, they would wash me up, they would wash the uh, other patients up, and then act like, okay, 
able to look. They were being taken care of. But that wasn't the case at all. Staff um, was would always yell at me and scream. It, I was scared and I didn't know. Not sure what's happening, but we're having some trouble. I think we're going to have to stop sharing. Um, All right. Well, there's more to that. And I hope folks who can can will look it up and uh, maybe you can share a link. Yeah. So the point is that when we talk about humanized long-term care, first, so, we want to have um, what to do. It's just, let me get this stuff. Let me get this one. I guess so, so it's just, I'm having some trouble here. Computer trouble, so my apologies. Go ahead and keep talking. Talking about. Okay. No, it's, right. it, it's, it's, uh, so appreciate it. It's unfortunate our text uh, glitch isn't quite there, but the core message here, which maybe I could have started with and then stopped at for a few minutes, people are demanding a whole new vision. They have a vision that's been a long standing vision. This is not a new thing. What it is is a new commitment to actually bringing that vision into reality. We had a meeting some months back with the guy in DC. This came out of this whole hundreds of groups getting on the president saying, dude, you actually have to, you need to get your shit straight. Um, so we met with the guy who's in charge of actually writing all these regulations. At that meeting, it was a Zoom meeting, he was in DC. We had people from a few parts of the country in, this, in our meeting. And part of what they were doing is sharing, these are people who are in facilities right now, sharing what goes on day to day inside those facilities. And the guy who writes all the rules, it's like, well, that's not right. It was, it was staggering piece after piece after piece. Oh, that's not, well, that's not how it's supposed to go. Oh, no, that doesn't happen. Oh, that's not right. No, that doesn't happen. It's like, no, no, it is, does happen. But we have these rules that are written to respond to all of these problems. And then the politically, the political decision makers act as though writing it down somehow fixed the problem. What we know is that the power balance day to day inside these buildings is so great that those rules, even if they're good rules, and a lot of them frankly are, just it's mythical. I'm reminded of years ago when we organized tenants around uh, people who had Section 8 vouchers, so-called Section 8 vouchers. And we did this forum with the agency whose job it was in Chicago to enforce the fair housing law that said landlords cannot discriminate against people because of their source of income and having a voucher is part of your income for rent purposes. So in other words, in the city of Chicago for a long, long time, it's illegal for a landlord to discriminate against people because they have Section 8 vouchers. They have other reasons to decline. Obviously, they can do all that stuff, but... That can't be the reason. We couldn't get people to believe that it was against the law. And we had in the room, the head of the department whose job is to enforce the law and people in the room said, no, that's not right. No, you're just wrong. You're just wrong. Because every day when they're looking for an apartment, they're told we don't take a section. Of it. Just flat out. Same kind of thing. The dude who writes the nursing home regs, well-meaning, smart, writes good regs for the most part. It's like, no, but that system isn't right. It's like, yeah, but the point is, they don't mean anything real day to day in the lived experience of people. So creating a disincentive, a financial disincentive for the owners, the people who actually run the show, the people who collect and pocket the money so that it's um, retaliation can become something that is a bright red line that just 
can't happen, shouldn't happen, can't happen, and they have, there's something that backs it up, and that people, residents, can themselves take some action. So there is a bill, Senator Lakeisha Collins has introduced it, it actually passed the Senate Judiciary Committee, but the lobbyists from the owners, the for-profit owners, to be clear, some of those agencies I mentioned before who got into the business from a charitable perspective, from a we actually want to care about people, you know, those they vary too according to what they are, of course, but they're not opposed to this. They're not fighting it. It's the for-profit owners, the one who are in it for the bucks, ones who are in it for the bucks. That are fighting it. So they're trying to water this down, trying to block it. And at this point, the coalition is working on negotiating. But what we really want, again, it's like such a small thing. Let our senators know that we should not be bowing to the for-profit industry. We should be passing a strong, functional anti-retaliation bill. It's a bedrock on everything else. If people are afraid to complain because they're not getting their medicine, they don't get their medicine. Unless it's up to luck or it's up to, well, somebody just decided to give you what you're frankly entitled to. If we have, if people have to depend on luck or charity at the moment, instead of having what is in the law, what are their rights, then you're not going to have a just system. You can't have it that way. So we're asking everybody who's listening to this to at least do this one thing. We'd love to be part of building this larger movement for a new future where it's person-centered, where people have freedom and dignity and true humanity. That's what we're talking about, humanized long-term care. And it's bigger and broader than just these nursing homes. That's the epicenter of the opposition to the better future. But what we need is this bigger, broader system that's going to have multiple kinds of programs that are suitable to the person and that each person actually has choices. Until you have real choices, until there's somewhere to go, you're stuck where you are. And that's part of what we need to build. So I pass out these flyers that have a link. There's a, a click here to sign a letter and to send a letter to your senator that folks can use. Uh, we can share that with them. Um, uh, with folks on Zoom, uh, if that's possible, in a second. Uh, but that's the deal. So it's a starting point. And frankly, compared to this big thing where we're going, and we're going there, this is a very small step. But it is, it is the, it is the, it is the platform on which everything else rests. If you can't talk about what you need, then you're not going to get what you need. Okay, if we're done, um, I'd like to, uh, I'm going to need to, uh, because of the internet connection and we're using it right now, I've got like a two hour limit. So I gotta go in and go out again. So uh, Charlie, I'm gonna temporarily make you the host and I'm just gonna make sure we get our connection up again. So uh, if you do not mind, uh, Charlie, you're just gonna pass the host on to you and uh, chat amongst yourselves for about three to four minutes. And what I'll do is I'll come back real quick. And uh, if Charlie is there, um, I'm just gonna transfer the host controls to you. And we'll uh, be right back in about two to three minutes. If you do not mind, Charlie. If you're ready, I'll transfer. Okay. Just, give me a second. just give me a second, please. I'm gonna be, we're gonna have to just uh, get our internet connection refreshed. Bear with me for a minute. No, there are any general comments out there regarding the situation? Any general comments regarding what you just heard? I've heard, I have a comment. Hi. Yeah, okay. I have a comment, Charlie. Uh, my comment is uh, I heard about uh, uh, the equity firm, investment firm, buying, buying uh, nursing homes, a, a lot of nursing homes. And then 
charging rent for the nursing homes, buying the land under the nursing homes. They uh, charge rent to the nursing homes. The nursing homes have to pay rent to them. And then the nursing homes go out of business because they can't pay uh, salaries and medication and all the other things that the people need. So then the owners of these nursing homes de declare bankruptcy and they get their money back. So they get their money two or three times back. Okay. And they make billions of dollars and these are billionaires in America. Okay. All right, Dan, we're back online. Uh, you're ready to take questions, we will. Uh, for those sure. of you in, in the, uh, in, in, on, online, raise your hand or uh, on the video, just go ahead and unmute and then wave or something. But I got the first question. You know, we've seen a lot of the, uh, we've seen a lot of this already, um, you know, as, as recently, you know, not only in the nursing home world, but this constant pressure to make money and to cut corners. We already see it now with Boeing, which is I think what you're kind of describing in the world of nursing, it's more emphasis paid on the book creed Another thing, what in your best estimate is the best way to reform something like this or have you given it much thought? Well, I think there's several different levels, but first and foremost, it takes organizing. So folks who are directly affected and I think folks have been doing that, but we need more of us and frankly, more people being able get out of a facility and into a community living, it means now they have more of their humanity and they can be agents of their lives in greater ways. So we get more people. Uh, most of the people, for example, who were willing to speak on the record on camera are people that are all former facility residents. That's not a coincidence. People are afraid to speak up, so they're afraid to actually tell people what's really going on. I've had people tell me, they're afraid to call me because they don't want to be overheard on the phone that's in the hallway and who knows what will happen. So I think first, how do we change it? First, more organizing, but it, and part of that is to get the message across that I'm not the best spokesperson. I can help deliver what other people are telling me, but um, folks like Dr. and Shelly talking about the experiences in more places. So if you're part of a block club or if you're part of a tenant council or some kind of senior group, invite someone to come and talk to your group. They can tell you what's really going on about the real lived experience because we do have to have a cultural shift. I think there's a lot of things that go into it that isn't about this topic, but you know, this idea of a throwaway society extends to human beings and we have to stop that. There's, there, nobody should be a throwaway. But the other piece connected to that is that there are rules. Okay. A lot of them. Okay. They're not enforced. They mean nothing day to day. Okay. And so there are agencies right now that at least in theory and by law have the authority to step in and make a lot of changes. And some of those folks are trying, just to be clear, but it's a system that is not built to actually meet human needs. It's a system that's built to meet political needs. Okay, Charlie, you're next with it. You got the next question, Charlie, since you're online. Um, go ahead and ask, and then we'll take another one in the uh, audience. So go ahead, Charlie. Yeah, if, if people from the audience, if the speaker could just reframe the question would be nice. But my question is, uh, how is the situation in Canada, given that they have a socialized medicine type of structure how is senior care do you know offhand is it significantly better or worse or uh, are they experiencing the same problems charlie's asking about how different it might be in canada where they have a single payer arrangement um, and many more public governmental controls over healthcare spending and all that i don't know so i wish i knew more about it but um, i couldn't say how that is I do know that at least the ways that profit-taking is done is going to be different in Canada, just because I know a little bit about how their payer system works, but I couldn't speak to how different it might be 
actually day to day in the institutions. Okay. Uh, yeah, let me allowed please and uh, loud when you ask your question. Sam, the speaker right. will repeat the question. Repeat the question if you don't mind, please. So I think uh, the question was if we're going to get rid of the for profit system, that wouldn't we have to turn everything over to counties or states or some governmental entity? To not, to yeah. not. So, first, there's a lot of ways things could be structured. And, uh, you know, as, as you know, there are lots of nonprofits that have lots of money coming through them. So just being technically a nonprofit doesn't mean that the revenue focuses on that. So there needs to be as much more accountability and monitoring of what the real money situation is. And that could go for nonprofits as well. Um, but there are lots of nonprofits that exist that have existed for a long time. And more of these could be organized in a manner that at least isn't driven by profit. So that they can still be private. Many of the institutions are private. There are at least a few dozen publicly owned uh, nursing homes of one kind or another in the state. And so to how those are operated and the specifics of what goes on in those facilities, you're gonna hear different kinds of stories about that. But there already exist um, a fair number of publicly owned entities. The, if I think the mission, the vision of the, this campaign is to focus on the people that need long-term care and that the system, however it's structured, needs to be built around the long-term needs of the person that needs long -term care and not about how do we design a system. Wait, 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 where's the cell phone? No idea. I just had it in my case head. that things with wait, 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 have to be turned over to a public is entity. That what, yeah. uh, oh, yeah. oh, whether oh, it is oh, or not, we still have to okay. structure okay. 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 Yeah, kind I, I, of humane I system where people have okay. all the restrictive environment possible, and that's whether it's on that light out there, so you can actually see. Yeah, 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 I know. I know. You just okay. want me to turn it off. Well, this I'm trying to do, and I'm having some. There's just some uh, trouble with uh, my system right now. I don't know what the hell. Is. I heard. Okay. It's what we're doing. And my driving back tomorrow. Ellen, can you please mute? Tomorrow. Can you please mute, Ellen? We're having trouble with here. So can you mute your sound, please? Get a host. Well, I, yeah, I got it. Hey, Charlie, can you transfer the host controls back to me? I don't know how to do that. I'm uh, going to participate in this. Okay. Thank you. Okay. I may need your help driving tomorrow. No, I know what I have. All right, Charlie, there's a, Charlie, there's a little thing on, on, the, on the thing. It says transfer host. Okay. All right. All right. Just give me a minute here. We can't. Uh, all right, Kathy, go ahead. You had a question, Kathy? All right. Uh, all right, Charlie. And the me, uh, me, Kathy Powers. Uh, yes, you got your hand up. Oh, okay. I didn't know. <laughs> I didn't know I if it was me question. or not. Um, I I've been trying to find a listing of the public nursing homes in Illinois. So you know, I went to Google. And uh, I could in the uh, Illinois site and everything. And let me tell you something. I have been unable to get a listing of the public nursing homes. And the reason why I was even looking it up is that some nurse, some public nursing homes want want to go private. So I wanted to see, you know, how many how many there were, and you know what what the the. Uh, yeah, yeah. The, the 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 system is set up so that you can't even know what's what's private. So I'm going to have to for you. 
But I want to bring up the fact that the system bar buries any public public health things that we've got any public centers. Uh, uh, do you know, Fran, how many uh, public nursing homes there are? I, I don't. I saw recently perhaps a number that I may not be remembering correctly that there were 70 around the state who were county owned, owned by counties. Uh, you know, we've, we've heard pretty limited that these county owned facilities that for a lot of the folks there, they feel somewhat positive toward them. But I think that, you know, again, without doing an action investigation, we're not speaking to that that question. I think the idea here is that experience is that first, there is an inherent tension between care and profits if an organ entity is organized for profit. So yes, our bias, our uh, orientation is to move away from for-profit based healthcare because there's an in inherent tension between those two things. But this, this campaign is focused as much or more on the idea that each person deserves to get long-term care in the environment that is the least restrictive and most appropriate for that person. And for what we know <clears throat> is that for large numbers of people, somewhere between ten thousands and tens of thousands, that right now they are not getting that here in Illinois. So there's definitely some issues about public and private and private nonprofit versus private for-profit, but fundamentally looking at the care being delivered to people in the least restrictive environment, I think that's the core value that this particular campaign is trying to bring forth. Okay, I think other questions in the room here. Um, I'm sorry, if, did you have something else? I did. I, this is such a, a, a tough, tough thing to do, is I went to Illinois Sunshine and I looked up some senators who were on this committee when we were having trouble getting it out of the committee. And we got nursing homes, we got uh, healthcare industry, ambulance companies, all donating huge sums of money to our, our senators. And I think that stinks. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Jake, is that you with your hand up there? Yeah, hi. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? We can hear you, Jake. Yeah, we can hear you, Jake. Hey, Jake, go ahead. Jake, you muted yourself. You just muted, Jake. You got hi, can you hear me? Yeah, we can, can you hear, hear me? you now. Yes. Oh, damn. We can hear you, hello? Jake. Go yes, ahead, Jake. Hello? Yes, hello. Hello? Yeah, we can hear you. We just let go. Oh, well. All right, Sorry, next questioner, please. Anybody from the peanut? All right, uh, can you uh, stand up and speak loudly if you can, or if you can't? Uh... Yeah. Just repeat the question at the podium. So you're asking a very broad question that I am not. The pattern. So the, the pattern is clear. The research shows very strongly that the for-profits are the ones that have lower staffing ratios, uh, more complaints, lower quality ratings, and a number of other kinds of problems that suggest less care. So in terms of comparing the two, you're, you're comparing typical or average set of thousands of or hundreds at least of institutions compared to another set of hundreds of institutions overall yeah the nonprofit ones whether they're church owned or not church related or not um, tend to be have fewer violations they have less uh, ghost staffing something that happens all the time although i know a couple of people who worked for one of the catholic run facilities where they did ghost staffing all the time according to the worker. I wasn't there myself. Um, so there are problems in both types, without a doubt. Uh, but when you add the, the broadly, the research shows that the for-profit ones are worse. He, he asking if they ran on the same type of budget. 
Uh, well, yeah, they do. And they operate under the same regulations. Uh, so they're both supposed to be delivering the same kind of services. Uh, and they're supposed to, each category of facility is supposed to do the same kind of reporting. But one of them, they have a profit line and that's why they're in that business. That's the tension that I mentioned. And so again, you're asking a very broad question, um, but the research shows broadly that the for-profits have worse care, more problems than the nonprofits. Yes. Okay. All right. Um, who else has a question here up in, in, in the audience? All right, Charlie, you got another one? Charlie, do you have another question? All right. Um, anybody else here want to comment? Okay, we're going to go now into our rebuttal period, which basically means uh, we're going to get a chance for everybody to make, let's wait five, seven minutes, make some comments. If some of you want to give your story as to what happened in nursing homes, it would be most welcome to. Um, would you like to step up? I mean, are you, are you, do you need us to bring you the microphone? Because we can have you just sit right there. I mean, if it's going to be a, a hardship, we can just get you a microphone and I'll let you speak for a little bit. And we'll go from there. Bear with me while we get you the mic. And I'll get the camera on you. And, uh, this goes for anybody here in the, um, in the uh, disability thing we might have. Oh, sorry about that. Okay, got a fist away from your rock. Uh, right, so you should be outside. Okay. Okay. Hi. Mm -hmm. Guys, okay, you can hear me. Okay. Once again, my name is Shelly, and just to reiterate what I was talking about um, in the nursing home the problem that many people don't receive don't receive the proper care uh, with meds. I talk about, I'm speaking for a person experience. I uh, didn't receive my medicine and I had taken sick, um, epileptic, and I had taken sick and had seizures and uh, the staff were just completely, they completely ignored uh, my situation. We've seen, I've seen friends and people in the nursing home that needed their medicine, but depending on how um, the staff, many of them had a bad attitude and they just ignored it. And it shouldn't be, it shouldn't be whatever type of attitude the staff had that day if you were gonna get the proper treatment. And unfortunately that tends to be, that tends to be the norm. Okay. That's just one of the biggest problems, one of the biggest problems we had. And one one last thing I want to uh, mention was about, you know, many times I uh, may have an accident um, where I become wet and the staff completely ignored me and I would get sores and things like that had other had other friends that tried to get their attention and these I tried to get their attention. They totally ignored me. And only when, like I said, we the raising, only when we had family members that came, that's when they actually paid more attention. Well, not more attention, that's when we were given the proper care. And that shouldn't be the case because we have some people that never had this.
किया है Okay, we're back online. Sorry about that. Hi, my name is Akta, and I was in a nursing home, and I had a roommate that I was always keeping an eye on her for her safety reasons, because she would always try to slip out of bed, and the nurses would never come and talk to my sister. So one time she did have to, you know, go to the emergency room because she did have an accident. And then I also have an allergy reaction and my doctor recommend I keep my EpiPen next to me at all times. And I did have an allergy reaction and, and I kept on telling the staff, I need to get to the hospital, I need to get to the hospital. So finally they called the doctor on call and the doctor on call recommended me to, to get to the hospital in, in time. So and I stayed in the hospital for like three or four days. So we need to um, educate the staff better of getting care to us when we, Need it when our doctor recommends that we need to keep something of an emergency equipment next to us at all times. But we're fighting to really uh, speak up for other people that's in the nursing homes because they don't they need to be you know get decent care that they need. Okay, uh, Jonathan, who's going to go next? Michael. I can can uh, can uh, push Michael towards the uh, towards the uh, okay, uh, Jonathan. Can you push Michael towards the gap there so we can see him? Okay. Oh, you need me to go forward? Forward so we can see you on, on the video. Okay. Just, uh, just get between that gap there so we can see you on the video there. And that, that way we'll be able to... Uh, How about now? A little more. Uh, just get between that gap there where you see it. Okay, and a uh, little, little more. A little more. Just, just try to get the between us. We get the camera in there. Try to get you a little bit better here. All right, he needs to come up another foot or two. It's not possible. Okay, that's fine. But we can see your face now. Okay. Uh, my name is Mike, and I had to figure out a way to transition. So I figured out a way to call my transportation so that I could go to my independent living center on a weekly basis so that I could get the information I needed so I could successfully transition into the community. It wasn't easy, but I had to figure out my own way um, doing that, and I I did that, and that helped me with my last transition. And I've been in my apartment for almost thirteen years now. Don't sit. Okay, you're blocking our guys. So can you move over a little bit? You're blocking our guys. So can you, yeah, move, just move your chair over about two feet. Just so just we just have to figure out a way to Thank be you. able to assist our brothers and sisters. Because one of the big problems is when you're in an institution, you can't get information from the outside. So we need to figure out a way to get them tablets, cell phones, whatever it takes to communicate. Is that it? Thank you. All right. Jonathan, who else has up? All right. There's a way for them to stand up that would be much appreciative. If, if somebody could stand up and talk. 
Who, who's next? Why don't you just have the speaker repeat the question? Charlie, we're why in rebuttals. We're in rebuttals right now, Charlie. That's why. Jonathan, anybody else uh, want to comment real quick while we're got the microphone out? Yeah. Okay. Uh, you you want to come up front? I mean, we can easily do that unless you want to sit there because I can't get you with the microphone from where you're at. very much for your guys cooperation and I know it's a little bit uh, somewhat challenging but do appreciate it if you want to you can put it right in this little slot okay. but I think we can hear you just speak loud okay Mr. Pitts, uh, my name is Linda Merrick I'm with Fire Center for Independent Living um, I've been in a nursing home for three years I know this this was premature. Their doctor overdosed. My roommate was hauled off psych med. I suspected that and a stat medic confirmed that she died. They starved residents with only four dollars per day for pay per resident. When residents didn't want to eat, they were given feeding tubes in stomach. Keep from falling and hitting their head on the floor, they were or bulky football helmets. So a lot of med was stopped suddenly by their doctor. So I went through withdrawal. I was dying over and over and over again in another dimension that I couldn't escape from at that time. I was times per day, 11 months, causing stomach cramps and fear runs. 
They said I had high ammonia levels in my liver and they didn't want to, to, me to die like another resident did. Then I was diagnosed with atomic colon after leave, leaving the nursing home. Nothing cleared up until I took aloe vera drink from Herbalife. I am a survivor. Now I am a volunteer advocate from Tiger Center for Independent Living. Good. Anybody else? Jake, did you want to make a rebuttal? Yeah. Uh, I, I, uh, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. I, I, had a, I had a question and then a comment. Uh, my question is uh, the, the, um, the, if, if uh, nursing homes are owned by the state, who, who owns them? CHA or the Veterans Administration or who? I think he's got a question for you real quick. Just, uh, you can, yeah. I think it actually depends. So the state owned ones, I believe, come under the Department of Developmental Disabilities, but I couldn't tell you for all of them. Uh, but ultimately, they're all owned by the state of Illinois, whoever the agency that manages it. It's not. So the CHA is technically a separate governmental unit from the city of Chicago, whereas the state agencies are part of the state of Illinois. Uh -huh. All right. And just my comment, I know some. I know someone who was down in Florida who was a victim of abuse. She was, I think she had um, hip replacement surgery. She ended up in a nursing home. I think she was 70 years old. And um, the, the nursing home was doing things that she didn't like, so she complained. They retaliated by giving her a shot of uh, fentanyl, which put her under. She, 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 uh, she was killed by the nursing home. So her family is suing the nursing home for it. Okay. Charlie, you want to make a comment? Char Charlie, you want to go next? Rebuttal? Yes. Okay, go I, ahead. Uh, I still have two questions and a rebuttal. Um, first question is, I see these senior buildings across Chicago. Are those private sector buildings or are those in some fashion public and private buildings? And number two question is, has the legislative agenda been summarized anywhere on a position paper that I could give to an elected official? And my rebuttal and remark is, I'd like to thank our speaker and the others in attendance for your fine efforts in this regard. And please give me information that I can share with others if they would like to be involved in your organization, such as when and where they meet or can receive updated information through things such as email or Facebook or other social media outlets. Again, thank you very much for coming to the college and please come back sometime and report on any progress that you have made in this regard. Thank you. Okay, your answer is questions and we'll go to Jonathan next. Yeah, the two questions, answers. So you're asked about the various senior buildings. Uh, that depends. So there's a wide mixture. The vast majority of those are privately owned and they are you know, publicly funded. And so I'll, so I'll, just, I'll, I'll just, I'll get it for you. Right. Uh, so it depends on the building. So it's something you'd have to look at. There are seniors that are publicly owned through the CHA, senior buildings, I mean, um, but it varies a lot. Most of them, depending on the program, are privately owned entities. Some of them are privately owned nonprofit. Some of them are privately owned nonprofit with for-profit uh, partners. And it all gets way too complicated, but um, so it's not exactly an answer to your question, but it depends on the building you're talking about. The second piece around the legislative agenda. So we, we didn't share this, but we absolutely have a one pager we're passing it out in person here that outlines what the program, what the values and the policies we're, we're after want, want to be. And I'd be happy to get those posted to either the uh, Zoom link or- <coughs> we'll, uh, we'll, we'll put it on a Zoom link. I mean, we, we could send it, it to me, please. Send it to Charlie and he'll put it on online. Okay. Uh, Jonathan, you're ready to do your rebuttal. Let me get that. Let me get that back up on the on the thing. Let me get that back up for you, Jonathan. I think 
Thank you, Fran, and to all the advocates for disability liberation. There's a fork in the road that uh, Fran explained tonight, and the two choices in that fork in the road is either independent living, which is democracy-based, or institutional existing, which is oligarchy-based. So in independent living, people are free to live how people choose to live. And in institutional existing, people are forced to forfeit rights of self-determination and are pressured to submit and being under control. In independent living, people are fully included in everyday community life. Uh, in institutional existing, people are denied autonomy and isolated from their community. In independent living, people are free to have many opportunities and choices. In institutional existing, people are expected to agree to the notion that a few more crumbs are better than nothing. In independent living, people are encouraged to contribute to the world as a participant. Uh, in institutions, people are subjected to the roles of spectators. In independent living, people are free to regularly receive outreach about and are aware of programs and services that are available to them. In institutions, people are rarely, if ever, informed about programs and services that provide them the opportunity to move out and are discouraged from learning what is available in order to begin the process of moving out. In independent living, people are free to experience home services, education, civics, health care, community services, legal services, work jobs training, accessible public places, infrastructure, public transit, nutritional food, clean water, housing, privacy, and retirement with dignity. In institutions, people are expected to tough it out and live without a safety net or support networks. In independent living, people are growing and learning to fully respect members of the disability community as autonomous individuals who have unique talents, skills, pursuits, contributions, values, and dreams that are brilliantly improving the way we live together and appreciate each other. In institutions, people are stereotyped by society as a monolithic group with very few thoughts, feelings, interests, ambitions, perspectives, or achievements. And as a result, Society takes people with disabilities for granted as having the demeaning status of second class peoples. In independent living, people are caring for each other, being one as a community. In institutional existing, is I the person all alone? Independent living welcomes and nurtures, so we are all in this together philosophy and spirit. Institutionalization promotes and profits off a sink or swim dogma and mentality. Independent living fosters self-determination. Institutionalization increases paternalism. Independent living empowers democracy and democracy empowers independent living. Institutional existing spreads oligarchy and oligarchy spreads institutional existing. Independent living is what we want and what we need. And institutional existing is the textbook example of nobody wants this, nobody needs this. So as we continue our organizing for people with disabilities to have the same freedoms and rights as everyone else, and we enforce laws that are on the books and begin to demand laws that don't exist, but should, uh, we remember that uh, any one of us today who happens to not realize how difficult it is to be in an oppressed group tomorrow could be, and that is why our organizing uh, welcomes everyone to join this struggle. Thank you, Fran, for an excellent talk. Hope to have you back very soon. You know, we've seen this uh, 
corporate corporate uh, greed versus uh, and the social inequities over the last few centuries. But you see, I'm kind of stuck in a quandary right now because I think that the modern corporation, the modern capitalist system, even the developments in healthcare have all been caused by money and research and drug companies doing things to get the things going. And it does produce a lot of benefits. And there is a profit motive in a lot of this stuff that really does make things work. The thing is, though, I don't know exactly how to stop some of the excessive greed, some of the uh, excessive corporate downsizings, because what we're, what you have talked about tonight is not only evident in healthcare, but maybe you can even see it just in the way that uh, airplanes are made. 60 years ago, Boeing came out with something called the 747. And it was one of the most lucrative and most successful and most uh, safe planes. And it's still flying. You don't hear about accidents with a 747. But when they decided to do another plane to compete with Airbus, they didn't go that same route where there was an overriding dedication to safety. It was more, but there was a lot more emphasis on corporate downsizing, on saving money, on keeping engineering costs to a minimum, on keeping regulation costs down. And boy, when they wound up with uh, also trying to keep the pilots out of scene of this for new aircraft, we all of a sudden saw a quick decrease in safety. Much like what you're seeing at nursing homes, that plane crashed and killed over 300 people. Now, my question is, where's the outrage? Where's the executives needing to be fired and go to jail? Where's the other stuff? We even saw the same thing happen in 2008 with the financial crisis. It wasn't capitalism that did it, but it was lying banks, lying valuations, lying people trying to sneak the system to get ahead. And that's called greed. My question is, though, isn't this always been the case with humans? Hasn't this always been the case over time? You know what? I think Jesus Christ said it best. There is sin. And that sin is all involved in every one of us. I'm sure whether you steal from a store or fudge your income taxes, you're effectively doing the same thing. And in all of us, we have that choice as to whether to do good or to do bad. For me, I take the Christian route. I try my best every day to live my life with God. And I have a little faith. And I think a lot of the reason we're seeing a lot more inequity in our society and a lot more problems is because we're forgetting things like the golden rule. We're forgetting things like the Ten Commandments. We're forgetting a society without God goes down. And we've seen this play out before. The Roman Empire, um, the communist system going down the tube because they were trying to actively forget God. And even in our healthcare system, if we would make the choice to preserve human life, and not worry so much about the profitability of the system, we would be a lot better ahead. Now, I don't know exactly what's wrong with the insurance company in the United States or the healthcare system, but we pay twice as much as any other country in the world. We subsidize drug things. You know, at the same time, you know, they claim that expenses on health insurance is about 20%. With Medicare, it's three. Like police and fire, it might be a good idea to go back to some public option on healthcare. Switzerland has a public private partnership, but the companies aren't allowed to really make money. They have to reinvest their profits in the business. Other places have, like Japan has a different system where it's all paid by the government, but they get a certain amount of subsidy. If you want extra care, you can get it. Sweden, on the other hand, you know, they like often say it's a socialist country. Well, it's not. It actually has gone back to a privatized system. What they do is they have a 50% tax rate. And when the government does want to do a contract, they'll take the very functions in the school or something, they'll put it in the contract, but they'll monitor it. And trust me, a lot can be said with corporations and their large purchase orders. Walmart, for example, used to be very, the cheapest way, cheapest thing, I don't care how it's done. 
public puts a little pressure on them. Now they're demanding that certain standards be made when they get a purchase order for a product. Now they're beginning to be made to be demanding of things like uh, you've heard of the investments that are trying to get out of oil companies. And then, of course, there's just other places that are just out and outright lies about how we're going to get out of our climate crisis, like the complete and utter dependence of renewables are going to do it. Well, I don't think that's the case because there's just way too much. You cannot get run a steel plant on electric power with solar panels and uh, whatever. What we can do, though, is I think get ourselves back into the right attitude. And that starts with all of us, our own choices of being right and wrong, our own choices of whether we accept God or not. And whatever you really feel, I honestly think that let's get back to the Ten Commandments and, and some of accountability, and I think we'll be a lot better off. And I, I do know that we're seeing the same patterns again. Human beings are sinners. They have a proclivity towards corruption. They also have the same proclivity to do good. I think God gave us some choices, whether we do good or evil. What we do with that freedom, we're going to be held account to, and we better make sure we're doing the right thing. Thank you very much. Some trouble technically, but we'll be all right. Go ahead, you're on the air. Okay, Pastor, thank you again. Thank you, friends. Super, such a good talk. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone, for the comments and questions. I, um, I agree with some of what Tim said. I'm scared to talk about the images. Between in between Street Friday and Sunday, and what I've seen is that the um, um, humans may have a um, proclivity um, to good go, go or evil, but um, what I see is uh, the problem is not necessarily capitalism, but I control capitalism and the big problem. And so I think when you allow all the power to go to the top, then that invites corrupt, more corruption. And so that's what control is trying to do. Keeps in the power and do some business and so they can fight back. We know it has no way to stand on. We need to speak up about abuse. And so I feel we give people the chance to fight back and make the others feel real beneath the pain. For bad behavior, bad treatment of people. And um, that's the only way I see the system ever changes. If you, you can't be punishable, only the workers, you have to punish the owners. The only way to be responsible for what happens. And so um, oh, I, I can't believe we're going to make a comment about a way to be in Jesus at home because college is not accessible location. And for so many years I've been coming here to make a lot of trouble with people with that. What the thought Kim has done a great job of trying to help out the keyboards in that to fight the people. You see the speaker with his empty excuses all around the camp. The people take 
Jake, you want to make a rebuttal again, or that, or use your hand up, Jake? Jake, you got your hand up again. You're gonna to have to unmute and make if you want to make a rebuttal. Jake. All right. Um. Okay. Is there anybody else who's got a rebuttal tonight from the from anybody else wanting to rebut tonight? One. Okay. Well, then um, I'll call our speaker back up. You just want to stay right there. I'll just hand you the mic. Unless you want to get, okay. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. All right. Our speaker gets the last word. <sighs> Thanks, everybody. Hang Thanks, on, all hang on. Wait a minute. Jake, is that you again? The two, 204 to unmute. Unmute if you want to talk. Is that Jake at 204 to? Oh, uh, no, no, no. Hey, go ahead. Are you done? Okay, let's get the, okay, go ahead and get the last word in. All right, I love having the last word. Doesn't happen very often in the world. I live in. So a couple of things. First, thanks everybody for being here. Thanks for focusing on Zoom. One of my purposes was to raise the experience and convey, as I said at the beginning, things that I've learned from some of the people here. It's been a privilege and really an honor to be able to work with some real heroes, American heroes. Yeah, and in terms of moving this agenda forward, as we said, there's a big long-term kind of process that needs a lot of involvement from a lot of people. That's point of inflection has been reached. We're moving in a different direction, but it's gonna take a lot, a lot of pushing. I hope people do join, hope people do get involved. On the very pragmatic, immediate short-term kind of thing, I'm hoping that Charlie or someone can share the link for folks to send a letter to your own senator on this anti-retaliation bill. I said, sport is growing. We got seven, senator, six senators on the Senate Judiciary Committee to vote in favor of it, but they all said they are hearing from the industry lobbyists and want us to try to figure out some concessions for them, for the industry. So that process is going forward, but it's really important for folks to actually communicate to your own senator that you think that freedom of speech should be fundamental, that people should be able to speak up without being afraid about what's going on in their lives day to day. That is such a basic basis for any kind of democracy, for any kind of humanity, that the idea that we're even negotiating over like how strongly the existing prohibition on illegal retaliation, retaliation needs to be in order to change things is a bad sign. We need to change the political conversation and each person sending that letter now is gonna make a difference. Last thing I will bring up Clark's comment, um, you know, College of Complex has, has had a long history, a lot of different things and places. And it's this is an example of good, well-intentioned people still contributing to ableism and discrimination. The fact that you know, several of the people aren't able to actually come into the main space here because of physical barriers is something that you know we shouldn't be we shouldn't have those kinds of spaces people need to have equal access as part of dignity so we all need to do better i need to do better all the complexes could do a little better and i'm still learning and i'm still trying to do what i can do but thanks everybody for being part of the conversation um i'll add one last thing about uh, comment on the Tim's, Tim's making. I think part of what he was saying, he said a lot of different things, but related to 
we have choices to make. I, as a human being, have to choose. What does my life mean? I have to choose what values I am going to exemplify in this world. Like everybody else, I have conflicts. I have self-interest and I have other interests. I have things that I want to do for me and I have things, that, things I want to do for everyone because we are part of everyone. I have to make those choices. Each, each of us has to make those kind of choice. It's not that there's an existence in my view, it's not that there's an evil and a good. It's that I am a player, I am a human, I have agency in this world, in this life, and I have to make those actions and I have to make those choices. But we also have to recognize that people with disabilities should also not only have to, but get to make those choices and be fully human and be agents in their lives and in our lives and in our world. All right, just go ahead and adjourn the college. Say we're adjourned and we'll be done. We are adjourned. And thank you for speaking tonight.